Dan Chinnick has been um, a great colleague and I dare say a great mentor uh, to me. And he will be joining us from a undisclosed location. And so I will turn it over to him now. But again, thank you and welcome. Thank you, James Christian. And uh, hope everybody can hear me in the room. If you can, can you raise your hand? All good? good. All right. So um, thank you, James Christian. And the center is so fortunate to work as part of a community of good government organizations dedicated to the achievement of government improvement that serves the nation. You and Max Steyer and the many partnership leaders and staff have been fantastic throughout our years of collaboration. We, we've often said that we really need to share office space because we do so much together. And now that you've moved into the building that we're in, that makes it really easy. And so we're really grateful to you for sharing this great space on the sixth floor of our building uh, as a neighbor here in Hamilton Square. As you mentioned, I'm here in an undisclosed location, otherwise known as Family Room uh, Chenock Central. Uh, I really wanted to be with you in person today, and I was feeling so positive about the release of our new book and this event. I was really feeling so positive that two days ago, the positivity overwhelmed me, and I actually tested positive. So I am fine, but especially given the center's research and support of public health guidelines for the nation, the last thing that I would wanna do is be patient zero for an outbreak across the good government community. So I'm here today as part of a multimedia event that you'll see going forward. So regarding that larger community, I wanna thank and acknowledge our collaboration with other leading organizations dedicated to improving government. In particular, given the book being released today, I wanna to thank the National Academy of Public Administration. Terry Girton and the Napa team here today collaborated with us along with the IBM Institute for Business Value, as well as nine authors who won a challenge grant competition to write about the future of government on content that informed the book being released today, Transforming the Business of Government. That content was also informed by IBM colleagues here and around the world. More about that in a, in a moment. Today's latest book is the 24th book that the sender has written, and we are always honored to be able to share insights in this way. So stepping back a moment, I joined the center as a senior fellow upon coming to IBM in 2010 and have benefited from the center's work before while an executive at OMB. So in one way or another, I've been part of the center's orbit across its 25 years and as executive director since 2012. So just a couple of thoughts about our mission and impact. First, supporting publishing and disseminating research that benefits governments in the US and increasingly around the world. Some 500 original works across the years, which continue to shape perspectives and strategies. In addition, this research informs scholarship and teaching across academia. Many articles and syllabi draw on centers reports in training future leaders. We're so pleased that many center authors are in the room today. Second, the center provides a platform for government leaders and influencers to share their challenges, opportunities, and perspectives with colleagues and the public through roughly 1,000 original podcasts, artfully led by host Michael Keegan. The center began the show in the form of a radio interview, and we still air twice weekly on Federal News Network, in addition to several major podcast platforms. So I looked it up. According to Wikipedia, podcasts began in 2004. Michael, you and the show were clearly ahead of your time. Numerous podcast guests are here today. Thank you for that. Third, so continuing our adaptation to new technologies, the center's blog provides widely read dialogue among our government, academic, nonprofit, and private sector partners. Once or several times each week and over 2000 times since we launched the blog in 2009. The blog is a forum to exchange insights and innovations, not just from our team, but also from other leaders across IBM, the community, and from government. Guest bloggers who are here today, thank you for your insights. And of course, we also have a larger set of social media engagements across major outlets and on our website. All of our content remains part of the public domain. Fourth, convening leaders in roundtables and dialogues on key issues of the day. These have become more common in recent years and now often occur at least monthly. Recent months have included discussions about how AI can modernize tax systems with IRS Commissioner Danny Werfel, building workforce capabilities to address pandemic-like shocks in the future with OPM Director Kiran Ahuja, and how AI and other emerging technologies can support governments around the globe, featuring Baroness Patricia Scotland, Secretary General of the United Kingdom Commonwealth. 
Many of you have worked with us in shaping these roundtables and providing insights for that and for the reports that have followed. So I will say now that if anybody thinks that they've been part of all four of these channels, please see Ruth Gordon after the meeting, uh, during the reception, she will give you the coveted center coffee mug because you'll be part of the center's four time club. The last collaboration that I mentioned with the United Kingdom Commonwealth has now been formalized in a partnership with those nations through the establishment of a Commonwealth hub for the business of government. The hub serves as a sister organization through the Commonwealth London headquarters and is led by Management Development Institute in New Delhi under the guidance of IBM Center visiting fellow Praja Trivedi. Praja is a Napa fellow and also the former Secretary of Performance for the Government of India. We work with the hub and other government leaders around the world on numerous initiatives in collaboration with IBM Global Government Consulting Leader Christina Caballé and other outstanding leaders here and in many nations. I would note that Praja is one of several distinguished scholars and former government leaders who work with the center in a visiting capacity, providing insights to help governments through blogs, reports, and advice. Other visiting fellows in the room today include former education CIO and CFO Danny Harris and former OMB Deputy Director and White House Recovery Leader Ed DeSev, who also serves as our Executive Fellow. So I focus on people in these remarks because it's through collaboration with current and former government leaders, associations, academic experts, and more that the Center's content expands and takes flight. We're especially grateful for our work with many leaders and groups here today in addition to the partnership and NAPA include ACT-IAC, the Professional Services Council, the Senior Executives Association, and many more. Many of you here today have been partners in this journey for the last 25 years, and we look forward to con continued collaboration for the next 25. I also wanna thank and acknowledge the engagement and expertise of IBM federal team and leaders who contribute their innovative ideas to strengthen center content and with whom we are proud to work many of whom are here. Next, I'd like to recognize all of the center fellows and staff who have generated such great content to help government over the years, and all of the senior IBM executives who have supported the center's work. From founding uh, partners Paul Lawrence and Kevin Bacon, that would be the IBM Kevin Bacon, to the leaders of IBM's government work over time, including Al Morales, Deborah Kammer, Chuck Pro, Dave Abel, Luann Pavko, Lisa Mascolo, and Andrew Fairbanks. Several are present today. And finally, special kudos to Emeritus Fellow John Kamensky, who since joining the center in 2001 has been the heart and soul of what we do. John is a national treasure and he deserves all of the many accolades he receives. As for the small but mighty center team, it consists of outstanding colleagues who I have the pleasure of working with every day at IBM. This includes our great show host and leadership fellow, Michael Keegan, you'll hear from Michael later, our outstanding senior fellows and former government executives, Margie Graves and Mark Newsom, and our operations director, Ruth Gordon. Thanks Ruth for all you do to make the center run and for making today's event possible. I'd like to ask the center staff to stand and be acknowledged for a moment. So if you could stand up. Terrific. All right, and now it is my honor to call to the stage our current leader, Susan Wedge, who is also my boss. So please be really nice to Susan. Uh, Susan is the managing partner for IBM Consulting, public and federal market business. This means that Susan leads IBM work with federal, state, local, education, and healthcare clients, both government and commercial. It is no small job. Susan has worked with government leaders for over two decades at IBM. She is a great supporter of the center. More broadly, Susan provides tremendous clarity of vision for IBM's support of government and great support of our teams who carry out these goals. So please join me in welcoming Susan to the stage. Uh, thanks, Dan, and uh, thank you everyone for coming today and being part of this celebration. Just listening to the impact of the center and really thinking about today and, and where we've been and where we're headed gets me so excited about the future. Um, the, the center really sits at that intersection of government, business, and academia, 
And it's viewed by government officials, many of you have mentioned already, and stakeholders as informed, influential, and independent. Uh, the center convenes, as Dan mentioned, multiple roundtables and conversations really aimed at driving policy implementation. We're bringing fresh thinking to government. Over the course of the 25-year history, the center has advised officials uh, across multiple in administrations on matters of both strategic and tactical importance in thinking about the future of government. Uh, the mission is more important now than it's ever been. With the digital disruptions, that's only increasing the advent of new technologies like generative AI, quantum computing, and the, that are opening new insights and are enabled over secure cloud-based networks. IBM believes that technology, if adopted right, can drive the creation of the future of government. Government that caters to worlds of possibilities where every citizen and every business can achieve their ultimate potential. The center sits at that forefront of what IBM brings to the public sector as an industry perspective. The center focuses on how government can best implement such key technologies and also how strategy and process can drive better outcomes helping leaders bring to bear data and insights that shape how government how government succeed. This impact spreads across every, sec, every segment of government, whether that be defense, intelligence, social services, public safety, education, every segment that's served across the nation. As Dan mentioned, with many of the ongoing initiatives and collaborations with governments like the UK and the Commonwealth, it's truly a, a global, network at this point, uh, which is, is exciting to me as well. Um, working across the world to provoke thought that challenges the status quo, creating the right policy framework to encourage participative government in all parts of the world, enabling a new generation to shape governments for future generations. Oops. It's been a great 25 years. I'm always in awe when I hear stats, like Dan said, of a thousand podcasts and how many books and how many reports. And we're really looking forward to the next 25 years. The center and IBM are committed to continue to lead research that drives improved mission and operational performance and will encourage cross-boundary conversations on how to address barriers that can too often constrain government from achieving outcomes for the public. The center strengthens IBM's ability to help create future governments and their partners can all be proud of. I'd like to congratulate the entire center team, both those of the past and those of the current, um, and everybody in this room who has contributed in some way, shape and form to the journey over the last 25 years. I'm super excited about the panels today and the research and dialogue that's going to contribute to what we're going to see over the next 25 years. It's now my honor and distinct pleasure to introduce the center's founding executive director, Mark Abramson, who will talk through the center's origins. Over to you, Mark. Hi. I'm uh, glad to be here and I'm glad to see so many of my uh, friends for a long time. So did you get that? Friends for a long time. Um, my, it's like my entire career is someplace in this room, but we're not going to take the time to go over each of you in the room and where I met you. <laughs> exactly. Uh, my job today is kind of, um, I hopefully will be quite short. Uh, I want to say how glad I am to be here and how proud I am of to having been part of the creation of the IBM Center uh, 25 years ago, which I find hard to believe. And one of the ways that I find that I'm getting a little bit older is I often say more frequently, boy, it was only the other day. And then somebody tells me, no, Mark. It was 25 years ago, which is plenty of other days. But what I want to go back to is in the beginning, we started with a very simple idea. Uh, could we create a small grants program 
for academics and public management, which we could give to senior executives in government within six to eight months. And was that Agile, Ed, before Agile? I was doing quick turnaround time. So Paul Lawrence and I came up with this idea. Then step number two is if you have a good idea, you have to get agreement on it. And we had to go two places to get agreement, which was a very exciting time. One, I was then part of Price Waterhouse. So we had to convince our own team, which sounds easy, but we had to convince our own team. And then we had to go talk to another team, which was Coopers and Librand, who we did not know. I knew a couple of them and we had to convince them and then we had to convince them all to agree on it, and we did. And it was a remarkable time. And I comment that it was a once in a lifetime opportunity when two people were creating a new entity. And Paul and I would go, you gotta create brand. So nobody's gonna know the new organization, Price Waterhouse Coopers, and nobody can say it, but you're still gonna have to advertise and you're gonna to have to look good and you're gonna to have to look like a citizen of the public administration community and public management. So we created the PWC was easier to say than PricewaterhouseCoopers endowment for the business of government. So that was kind of step number one. Step number two is what I'm really proudest of among many things is the team we put together because uh, anybody, uh, sports fans in here is about the NBA, remember the dream team, I guess was a 1988, the basketball team for the Olympics. Well, I'm a sports fan, but I wanted to create my own dream team of public management experts. So I did not have to look very hard along. I wanted John Kaminsky and Jonathan Brule to be my dream team. And I wanted them on the same team and we could do anything. And John, was John? I saw him, can you stand up? You mentioned him. John, stand up. Now, to continue the basketball, he's the guard. And then we needed a tall guy <laughs> to be <laughs> the center of the team who knew public management and somebody with a background in OMB. So if you think about that, it's Jonathan Brule, you know, and he'll be speaking after me. Uh, and then we needed somebody to help me to run the place. And that's Ruth. Ruth, I want you to stand up so we know who you are. Ruth. Now, my story about Ruth is uh, I remember there's things that stand in your which is a sign of how long it's been. Uh, and then I recruited Michael, who was a rotating position. We would bring in young uh, IBM consultants who wanted a break from their regular consulting. So we brought on Michael on a, consult, a rotating position. And it's now he's been in the rotating position for 18 years. <laughs> 18 years, which I think is the longest rotating position <laughs> in uh, one place. So then my kind of final thing I wanted to tell you is what we try to do is I wanted, I know we have all ages in this room. Um, what we started out with, and this is part of the story, with hard copies. Does anybody remember what a hard copy was? I wanted to show people what a hard copy was, if anybody had forgotten the original grants announcement. And uh, now there's no longer hard copies of things. You have to try hard to get a hard copy. So I am just glad to, to see all my old friends here, or my friends for a long time, and to have been part of the IBM Center at the beginning. And I'm just very proud of it. And I'm really proud of 
the entire team. And my final comment is, I would also like to take credit for Dan Chenix hiring, because my theory is I hired Jonathan, who then hired Dan, so I can take credit for both Dan and Jonathan. And now it's my pleasure to hand it over to the tall guy on my dream team from OMB. Thank you, Mark. Um, I sort of filled a position of transition between Mark and Dan. Um, and Mark built the center. Um, I think by the time I was there, there were over 300 books and there were publications that were innumerable. Um, he, it was really a, a, a quite a force and it was top notch <laughs> academic research. And um, the center had, had a lot to be uh, proud of when I came on uh, or moved up to the executive director. And we were um, often seen, in fact, uh, if you uh, looked at the magazine that we uh, published that a number of you, I think, or I can see two, three, a number of you made the cover of the magazine, which had uh, nine sort of Hollywood squares pictures on the front. Um, and it was really, Quite a, quite a magazine. Uh, it was so popular, in fact, that some government executives, and I'm looking around here for Dave Walker, Dave Walker had it on his coffee table um, on the, his, his office. And so you went right in there. The first thing you saw was the IBM Center, and then you saw Dave. <laughs> um, it really uh, was, it, it was a mark of, really a, a, a mark of the uh, impact and the influence of IBM in the terms of credibility and uh, expertise. And we wanted to, to do that um, to assist government executives um, in, in achievement of management of their mission and, ma and management challenges. Um, and we did so by uh, connecting the, the uh, agenda and what was happening to it with a radio show, the, the, uh, the publications and the books and increasingly um, under my term um, with Gadi Ben Yehudu, who's here somewhere, um, we moved towards digital and we moved towards blogs and um, any form of digital impact we could. Um, and I think the crowning, um, crowning uh, element or, or, or indication of that was by January, 11, January 2011, right. there was a special issue um, done by the academics in, um, cr and across a number of the universities, and it was called JPART, the Journal of Public, Man Public Administration Research Analysis. And JPART was, um, came out with a special issue in January, which said the following, it was very clear that the IBM Center's reports were written for government executives and managers, and that in making the decision to fund research proposals, it looks for very practical findings and recommendations, not just theory and concepts, in order to assist executives and managers in responding to their mission and management challenges. And that was sort of the gold standard of what we were trying to achieve and to see be recognized by the academic community as doing that was uh, quite an accomplishment. And so um, I'll leave it with that. And uh, I'd like to uh, ask Michael Ke Keegan to come forward and tell us about the video that we're about to see. Absolutely. So um, not to play Vanna White, but I guess this is what Dan was talking about. So if you're four, if you got four, you're gonna get these. And, um, we didn't do an Oprah thing. We didn't put these under your, under your chair, but you can pick one of these up today. Okay. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna um, uh, we're gonna be quick. Um, we'll try to catch time. Uh, so next up is a video, giving you a glimpse into the our latest book, and this is the cover of the latest book. But the title is "Transforming the Business of Government: Insights on Resiliency, Innovation, and Performance." Video. It gives you sort of a highlight into the impetus of why we wrote the book, but more importantly, it introduces you to several contributors 
and their insights on the resiliency aspect of the book, which, as Dan mentioned in his opening, derives from the Future Shock series we did with the IBM Institute for Business Value and the National Academy of Public Administration. Immediately following the video, which I hope you all enjoy, I'll chat with three of our nine challenge grant winners who wrote chapters offering insights into the innovation and performance side of the book. So we're trying to give you a little sense of what it is. So can we hit the video now? If the 21st century has provided any lessons so far, it is the power of the unexpected. What has been starkly revealed is how systems in place to meet anticipated problems failed when the unanticipated happened. As we know, we're emerging from globally, from an environment of incredible shocks over the last couple of years. First, of course, was the, the great pandemic of COVID-19, but also environmental disasters from, from related to heat, flooding, droughts, wildfires. At the same time, we've had continuing cybersecurity challenges and su supply chain disruptions, and as well as other shocks to the system. In many ways, traditional approaches of government seem obsolete and incapable of properly responding to these disruptive events. Large bureaucracies are constructed with and work best in environments of stability and predictability and where standardized service delivery can be delivered. That's not the environment that we're in today. Given this new reality, now more than ever, government leaders need practical, actionable insights on how best to manage and lead through uncertain and disruptive periods. And that's why the IBM Center has published Transforming the Business of Government, Insights on Resiliency, Innovation, and performance. The book identifies capacities governments need to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to crises and build resiliency across these domains and beyond. During the last three years, a perfect storm of natural and geopolitical events has disrupted worldwide supply chains in ways that few governments could have anticipated. Really, global supply chains have experienced major constraints over the past several years. Uh, many are still recovering and responding to these threats. Uh, for instance, in 2022, almost 40% of global CEOs reported supply chain disruption as a major challenge. And this is a significant increase from the previous year. Supply chains are being affected across their entire ecosystems, uh, with global chief supply chain officers reporting significant disruptions related to demand volatility, transportation, uh, logistics availability, uh, supply base inventory uh, availability, technology adequacy, and availability of skilled labor. And we coined the term a supply chain immunity to refer to a condition in which an organization is prepared for different types of disruptions by having an action plan in place. And that includes uh, developing supply chain immunity involves adoption of digital technologies to improve visibility and transparency, uh, supply chain diversification to plan ahead and create more options for mitigation, as well as uh, increased collaboration and partnership with suppliers to align planning across multiple tiers. We're also seeing some organizations experimenting with quantum computing tools and methods and predictive analysis for better decision-making. Government digital platforms and the sensitive information they store represent a target-rich environment. Why? Infrastructure. Um, and it's not true just of government, it's true of, I think, institutions of all kinds, but for years, we've had a pattern and a practice of layering one generation of technology on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. And I like to use the analogy of, um, you know, just putting paint over something and putting a fresh coat of paint on and then another fresh coat of paint and, and so on. And at some point, um, you know, the buildup of 
those layers of paint starts to cause problems. It's not necessarily that the old technology is fragile, but it's the layering of these and the interfaces between them and so on that become uh, the points of vulnerability. Cyber attacks is just one of the fundamental core competencies that organizations have to have. If they're providing services to citizens or um, you know, essential services in, in any capacity. And that resiliency can be thought of in a bunch of different ways. One is uh, recovery from an incident. Um, and these incidents can be anything from an actual cyber attack to um, the bringing directly on the institution to the disabling of core capabilities. And in many cases, these are outsized services or, or uh, outsource services or uh, cloud services or whatever, whatever they may be. If any of those are disabled and become unavailable, it can bring a halt to essential services as well. The cascade of catastrophic events and the constancy of uncertainty raises fundamental questions about how governments can anticipate, prepare for, and respond to these and other shocks yet to come. So what practical steps can governments take in the near term to build resiliency? As we all know, that the, the solutions to all of our cross-cutting problems are going to be networks. No individual agency or program is going to be the solution to a complex set of arrangements. As one practitioner put it to us, is that you're not going to have complex problems solved by individual agency silos. And so what we found is that networks don't form spontaneously, however, rather they are intentionally developed, and that is they choose a governance, the participants select a governance mechanism, and then they're carefully managed. We all have experience in, in strategic planning in individual agencies, but increasingly these types of future shocks are required either whole of government or in many cases even whole of society types of responses in order to deal with them. And so we wanted to catalog and take a look at what does, what does strategic planning look like when it goes outside the boundaries of individual organizations and indeed, indeed encompasses different sectors, levels of, and, and levels of government. The fast tracking innovation and, and uh, transformation across the network. And here I just want to give a special attention to just the vitally important effort of the IBM Center and the National Academy of Public Administration for the, uh, um, for the Agile Government Center that they uh, produced, that we deeply influenced to our thinking and how do we bring Agile Government using technology, using generative AI into actually spurring real, real fundamental changes in the construction and, and the service delivery of organizations. To commemorate the IBM Center's 25th anniversary and identify innovative ideas that help government move forward in the face of an inevitable uncertainty, we conducted a challenge grant competition. This competition solicited essays from academics and thought leaders describing a future of government that can help inform agency readiness, identifying strategic actions for innovation and performance to drive agency missions forward. The last half of Transforming the Business of Government, Insights on Resiliency, Innovation, and Performance explores such topics as AI, quantum computing, data and evidence, oversight, shared services, and customer experience. With this disclaimer that no one knows for certain what may come next, the insights and actions detailed in this book provide a pathway forward in transforming the business of government. Uh, the video provided a glimpse into the resiliency insights of the, of the book. And now we wanna to turn to the innovation performance insights. And I welcome three of the contributors uh, and challenge grant winners uh, representing such diverse topics as quantum computing, AI and payment integrity. And we kind of, I want to start with, an, uh, do this in really quickly, because I want to get back some time and get to the plen plenary panel. 
So Renata, um, for everybody on the panel, I'd like for you to tell us a little bit about yourself and give us an overview or the thesis statement of your of your chapter. Renata, would you start? Sure, and thank you for putting this on and the opportunity. Um, it was remarkable to hear the history and uh, where you are today. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'd say the common thread throughout my personal and professional life has been, I deeply care about a well-functioning government. Um, it makes me mad when it doesn't work. And um, I also have learned um, in my um, public administration studies that budget is the heart of government. So when you know where the dollars go, you understand where government allocates its resources and its priorities. And if you can affect that, then you can basically fix any problem. <laughs> Um, so where I sit today is I'm in the U.S. Treasury Department. I'm in um, domestic finance within the Office of the Fiscal Assistant Secretary. And um, to a kind of um, lay person, I'd say we're the financial plumbing of the federal government. So you don't want to know about us, right, because it means something's broken. Um, but our mission is really to promote the financial integrity and operational efficiency of, of the federal government. And... Um, and so in that role, um, I work to champion innovation. You know, how do we kind of take sort of a back office function and infuse data analytics and technology so it continues to improve? Um, how do we ensure accountability and transparency? So truly accountability, right? The accounting piece of it <laughs> and those standards, but also transparency. So things like USA spending um, and then, um, and I'd say, you know, alongside that integrity. So how do, how do we ensure, pe make people confident that the government is spending dollars in the right way? Um, so that brings me to the thesis of my book, which is really all about payment integrity. And um, I, you know, payment integrity is about paying the right person in the right amount at the right time. Um, and when you think about a government payment, it's probably the most direct way that you and I interact with the government. And if we get that wrong, we really reduce trust in government. So if your uh, social security payment is misdirected or in the wrong amount, or if your identity is stolen, that's a really bad experience. Um, but you know, on a broader scale, um, if we can't trust that our government's going to um, prevent fraud and improper payments, then policymakers and lawmakers are going to be less eager to fund important programs that ensure economic stability and provide a social safety net. Um, and then finally, I'd say, um, you know, uh, I took a class in under in, in graduate school called catastrophic budget failure. <laughs> and, you know, Popular it's class. really, I have three young children. I think about, you know, how do we uh, make sure that we spend our dollars wisely, right? And that every dollar is spent in the right way. Um, and so that, the thesis of my book is really how can we apply um, technology, tools, data, expertise, but also build partnerships between states and agencies and oversight and, and share best practices in a way that actually helps to activate them. Thank you. Paula? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, to both introduce myself and to tell you about my contribution to the project, I'm actually going to tell you how I first learned of the work done by the IBM Center for the Business of Government. Um, uh, it was uh, several years ago, quite a few now that I think about it, when I was a graduate student at Georgetown, where I was getting my PhD in political economy. My own work focuses a lot on the interaction between states and markets, government and what governments do and how that impacts act uh, economic activity, both domestically within countries and internationally. Um, I focus quite a bit on former communist countries, but throughout all my work, I focused quite a bit on the impact of technology on economic development. I love the work done by the IBM Center because it often focused on what the governments do. Um, so I got to learn a lot on that side of things. So it, it actually did quite a bit of the legwork for me. Um, so I got to learn from a lot of experts while also continuing my own work on the interaction between government action and, and markets. As I uh, got a job as an assistant professor at Duke University in Shanghai, and now I'm as a visiting fellow in uh, at Stanford, I kept working on on this project. And when I saw when I got the email about the the challenge, I I really uh, went back to one of the really um, key elements of my work, which is the role of technology, and focusing on quantum computing, which brings me to my current contribution. 
in my uh, in my chapter, I focus quite a bit on what the government um, um, might, how the government might be impacted by the development of this technology. I describe what it is um, and how um, three main areas that I focus on can impact the government quite a bit, namely cybersecurity, and we've already touched a little bit on it uh, in the video, uh, but also sustainability, uh, as well as the um, uh, human resources that would need for quantum technology to develop. Uh, in my uh, chapter, and hopefully in this conversation, um, I discuss ways in which governments can, um, you know, take the lead, but also how they could be impacted in negative ways by the development of this new technology. Thanks. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Kayla Schwer. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Albany in the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy. Um, I also hold a joint appointment at the Vrie University Amsterdam in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration. Um, my research broadly looks at public and nonprofit management, um, but I'm specifically interested in topics around emerging technologies um, and how public and no nonprofit organizations can use those technologies to solve problems and engage diverse communities. Um, so some of my current projects look at the role of UX design principles in sort of digital interfaces for reducing administrative burdens, uh, ways that we can, you know, help citizens understand the information, ways that technology can be used to do that. Um, and then I'm also increasingly looking at AI, of course, um, and different topics around trustworthiness um, and the role of explainability and interpretability in um, that uh, interaction which is a perfect segue to um, the uh, my contribution with um, my co-authors, Ana Maria DeMond, Andrea Petruco, and Ilya Murtazza-Civili. Um, so we looked at the role of AI in the customer experience, but really sort of taking a more holistic approach to understanding the customer experience as both before that explicit interaction or experience, um, and specifically the role of public procurement in actually acquiring the technologies that can um, improve the experience. So sort of how can um, procurement agencies evaluate these technologies and ensure that they are acquiring uh, responsible and ethical technologies that can in fact enhance the customer experience. Thank you. Paul, I'm gonna start with you. We're gonna do a round robin, digger, uh, deeper dive. So your chapter is on quantum technology. I'd like you to tell us as a level set, what are we talking about when we talk about that? And more importantly, what impact could it have on go how government functions? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to like very, very briefly um, uh, describe uh, sort of what, what this is. Um, more in the in the book, uh, uh, I also offer there quite a few resources on reading more. But at the at the most basic level, um, you know, quantum technology just uses quantum um, 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 physics principles. Uh, in classical physics, you have um, uh, information stored in um, binary bits, for example, in computing, zero ones. In quantum uh, computing, you have have zero, one, and both. So using these kinds of um, uh, quantum physics principles, such as superposition and entanglement, you are able to conduct much faster computing. And that's the, 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 the key point here. Uh, the main way in which quantum computing can revolutionize not just government, but also the economy in general, uh, is through this much faster um, uh, power to compute. Uh, in, in the chapter, I give a, a quick example where um, to, to solve a maze, a classical computer would just go through each one of the, the paths until it finds, finds the exit. A quantum computer um, can actually use all the paths at the same time and much more quickly find a solution. Um, so that's the, that's why quantum technology is important and developing this matters. For the government in particular, and the video already mentioned cybersecurity, and that's what I'm gonna start with, um, is the fact that if the actor that has a quantum computer is not the government, the government become, becomes very vulnerable. That means that a lot of very sensitive information, not just national security, but you know, banking information, we talk about um, uh, financial transactions, um, a lot of information that right now is encrypted could be very easily decrypted because what com quantum com technology provides you is the ability to very quickly um, decrypt that information. Um, uh, as I was doing more research, more in-depth research for this chapter, I, I came across some very very alarmist um, um, uh, descriptions of how even data that is, can be downloaded today or was downloaded in the past, once, uh, say, a, um, um, a less than um, uh, ethical actor has access to a quantum computer, they could actually decrypt that past data and have access to that information. So it's very important for the government to have 
also um, um, uh, an important role to play in this. And in the chapter, I describe um, quite a bit of uh, government action in this in this field and all the ways in which the government not only is trying to shore up this vulnerability, but also to develop more um, human resources and educational resources to develop this technology further. Just as an FYI, right now, um, quite uh, in the US and internationally, quite a few actors have various levels of quantum sophistication for this technology, but actually we're still five to 10 years away from like very performing quantum computers. So um, we're not there, we're not panicking yet. So um, both private and public actors still have uh, um, um, quite a bit of work. Do you tease out any challenges in the chapter? I think that's one thing you might want to talk about. Uh, absolutely. So um, uh, I talk quite a bit about uh, quantum security. Uh, oh, sorry quantum technology to you be used for cybersecurity, but I also discuss uh, additional ways in which uh, having access to quantum technology can help with um, facets such as sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that right now, for example, um, uh, you know, you can decrypt information even with computers today. It just takes a really, really long time. A quantum computer, and actually I have the number right here, a quantum computer can do the same uh, task as a regular computer at 0.002% of the energy use. So that for, uh, say, our world that right now is facing the challenge, uh, the challenge of climate change, that matters a lot when you're trying to think, um, and I think uh, we'll, we'll discuss more about the importance of AI, um, you know, just to run AI takes a lot of energy, a lot of power. If you base AI using quantum um, uh, technology, all of a sudden your energy requirements will not be that uh, high. Great. Uh, switch over to Kayla. Government procurement, how does it both contribute to the deployment of AI and benefit from the use? Yeah, so in our chapter, um, again, sort of understanding the customer experience is sort of also this, everything that leads up to that actual explicit interaction. Um, we look at public procurement um, from sort of two different broad perspectives, a more operation um, perspective and a more strategic perspective. So the operations being sort of how AI can actually help to improve government service processes, all of that that does indirectly and directly um, affect the customer experience. And then also, I think, on the more strategic um, point of view, I think similar to, to what you were discussing in terms of how AI can help um, agencies just process information so much faster and how that leads to a more improved um, customer experience. Um, and then also just how AI can support the procurement process in terms of, you know, evaluating vendors, assessing vendors, um, being able to generate AI, being able to potentially um, generate contracts and sort of, you know, using these technologies in more strategic ways um, that may indirectly improve the uh, customer experience. One thing I liked about your chapter is you identify the challenges folks are facing at the intersection of AI, customer experience, which is huge now, um, and procurement. And I would like you to touch on those challenges, but maybe even tell us more about the design principles that you folks crafted. Yes, yeah, so um, we outlined seven design principles in our chapter. These are not meant to be definitive or exhaustive in any way, um, but really just to sort of get um, us thinking about ways that procurement can kind of function as what we call a gatekeeper um, in the in you know the acquisition and adoption and implementation of AI in government agencies. Um, and so we really, you know, I think a lot of the conversation around AI more generally is based on sort of these really high level abstract principles, transparency, accountability. I think we can all agree that these are, you know, inherently good principles and we should be abiding by them. But I think what's missing a lot from this conversation is how those actually translate into the day-to-day -day operations of agencies. And so one way that we are looking at this is from, you know, procurement as again, as this gatekeeper that can, you know, begin to evaluate um, vendors based on, you know, transparency and accountability and begin to translate some of these high level abstract principles into, um, you know, contracts and, and, and sort of, uh, yeah, the adoption and, and management of technologies that actually live up to things like, you know, transparency. And so, one thing that we also look at in our principles is this idea of not just transparency, but also interpretability and explainability, um, really sort of understanding that that is, you know, just as if not more crucial than this idea of transparency. Um, and then another one is, you know, just vendor governance, also sort of understanding um, who the vendors are, their values, the way that they might um, translate into the technologies that are being developed with this understanding that there is a direct um, relationship between those things. Um, and then another thing is just sort of yeah, understanding 
how the acquisition of these technologies um, indirectly improve all other aspects of public service and being really aware of that. Thank you. So Renata, um, I'll come back to you. And one thing we talked about, and you do a wonderful job in your chapter, is how, how can a rigorous focus on payment integrity strengthen trust in government? And I was hoping for this audience, you probably don't need to do it, but for a level setting, could you tell us what exactly payment integrity means and maybe tell about improper payments as well? Yeah, this is, um, um, it's, a, there's a definition for it. So improper payments are payments that could be errors. So they could be overpayments, underpayments, or just cler clerical errors, but they could also include fraud. Um, and financial fraud. So um, I'd say payment integrity is all about making sure that the payment is really in the right amount, going to the right person or entity, and at the right time. Um, so, so that's kind of the the kind of um, simple explanation of it. Great. And so, the the real crux of that question was the idea of strengthening trust in government, focusing on payment integrity. You kind of alluded to it in your opening about the fact that if I have a check coming, I want it to come. Is there anything else you wanted to share in that respect? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, in terms of, so I mentioned, you know, that direct interaction with government, um, and it's really kind of the way that we, especially in the federal government, um, so provide services to the public. We, you know, send money to states, to nonprofits, to, to entities to execute, um, you know, change uh, on behalf of the federal government. And so um, I think, you know, in terms of trust in government, you want to get that right. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to do it in a way that's not cumbersome. So I kind of talk about this um, concept of like payment integrity being the flip side of the coin as it relates to um, a more seamless interaction with government. Um, if you think about all the things that are required to enable like a real-time payment integrity landscape, it's um, using data effectively. It's systems that I can actually respond. Um, and it's uh, connecting the dots. And so that also contributes to a positive experience. Yeah. Uh, one thing I loved about your chapter is this call to action to pivot from, and in the light of, of COVID-19 response and all the money that went out the door, it's the you know, the prevailing mindset of recovery, put it out and then collect it later. And what you say is, can we shift that to a more of a prevention mindset? I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, I think government's really good at responding to crises. And my experience in the federal government, we're also really good at responding to crises. But we're not so great at having a healthy sense of urgency about prevention. And so I think um, since we've been tracking this improper payment number, I think since 20, 2003, um, there's been a lot of focus on reporting and kind of slicing and dicing. Um, and people in the compliance space are like, we want to actually prevent. Like, we feel like we're spending so much time calculating, but we would love to kind of shift our focus on that prevention side. And I think that the technology um, and the kind of um, partnerships and the kind of sense of urgency post-pandemic is ripe for us to actually be able to make that shift. Yeah, what I found interesting is your your chapter kind of brings together at least the AI aspect in terms of the tool you could use because the data, it's so much data and the AI will help you figure that out. Um, I want to go back to uh, Kayla. Um, question that came up was uh, what role do effective private public partnerships, and I'm thinking around standards, um, could help like say with Gen AI? What are you seeing out there? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think, well, I've been obsessed with everything that's happening with OpenAI right now and, you know, the controversial and unexpected firing of Sam Altman and then his rehiring. Um, my husband calls it my nerd drama. Um, but I, you know, I think that that whole case really shines on a light, uh, shines a light on how important it is of like who is in charge here and this idea of governance. And, you know, I think that this idea of public private partnerships are crucial in that because it's not, I don't think any one actor should be in charge of this um, or in charge of setting standards. And I think this collaboration and more collaborative approach is going to be really, really crucial to sort of getting this right. Um, or in some cases, just getting it less wrong. Um, and sometimes that's just as um, important. important. And um, and so, yeah, so one way that we, my team have been thinking about also, uh, you know, going forward with our work based on um, our contribution here is thinking about the role of these public-private partnerships and sort of uh, navigating this 
this whole new uh, era of AI we find ourselves in together um, and collaboratively setting those standards, um, you know, trying to understand also how to bring academics into that conversation as well um, and understanding that uh, diversity of perspectives is really crucial in that. Thank you. Uh, Renata, um, are there any other strategies you want to touch on for advancing uh, payment integrity? But more importantly, what can Treasury, what can your department do to kind of promote it more? Yeah, so um, for you govies out there, you know this, but we have a really unique perspective at Treasury. We pay 90% of government disbursements, so that's close to $6 trillion this last fiscal year. Approximately $1.4 billion payments go out every year. Um, essentially, we're the largest payer in the universe. Uh, I think that's accurate. And, um, you know, and so we have a lot of information, right? We know where those payments go, whether by check or um, electronic. Um, and uh, there's a lot that we can do kind of at that payment phase, um, at that payment rail phase where we can identify potential fraud, we can identify potential kind of duplication or anomalies, and we can partner with agencies and federally funded administra federally funded state administered programs to um, alert them to that potential risk. Um, it's not really our lane to say yes, no, in terms of whether that payment should or should not go at the door, but we can certainly provide more value in terms of um, connecting the dots from what, from the lens that we see. Great, um, Paula, I wanna talk about some of your recommendations, but more particularly, how can we focus resources, energy on building a quantum workforce? That's a, that's a very good, very good question. Um, just briefly on my recommendations, actually, I'm going to pick up on two that were kind of mentioned in the in the video in a way. So one of the contributors were, was mentioning the importance of networks. So in my, in the in the contribution, the chapter, I also talk about um, uh, this um, uh, the the way that the government, as as an important actor, an important spender uh, on on quantum technology, can actually bring together not just the domestic actors within the U.S. universities, uh, educational institutions, and private actors with. The, with also the, the the government agencies and and, and different um, uh, uh, departments, uh, but also create collaboration internationally, uh, because it's um, oftentimes you don't know where the next innovation will come from. So you want to make sure that you it, it's it's within friends. Uh, another important um, uh, element mentioned was uh, by Tony Scott about this idea of layering technology. He kind of like mentioned it as a um, as a point of vulnerability, and I agree with him. But in my chapter, I also found that this could be a point of strength. So actually, one of the, the greatest um, possible, you know, um, uh, contributions for the future for quantum technology won't just be quantum computing on its own, but actually hybrid systems, where you use already classical existing computers with quantum computing capabilities, which means that, you know, thinking in terms of like the quantum workforce, you can have people who are already expert in their own subject, but they don't need to become also experts in quantum computing. They can just use traditional computers, but the hardest tasks of analysis, of looking maybe through those fraudulent payments can be done by the quantum um, uh, element of the system. So that could be another way in which the government um, can um, uh, really help because these systems aren't the one, uh, I mean, they're pretty, um, and I was uh, impressed and um, uh, uh, really happy to see how many high school, high school students took that class. There were over several thousand students going on Zoom every week uh, learning about this and also adults trying to figure this out, um, uh, trying to become more competitive because actually in quantum computing, there's one qualified candidate for three jobs right now. So it's it's a very good field to be in in the future. But the government, because it's already spending so much money, not just for the, the cybersecurity part, can actually like use that money to bring in more educational resources to build that future for the um, to build that future workforce. Sure. So this is the last question. We'll close. But uh, is there anything we missed? Do you guys, uh, what's the future look like? Anybody? Take a shot. Now, are we good? I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic. Good way to end the uh, yes, end the panel. <laughs> so Dan, Dan, wherever you are, we're going to pass it over to you to the plenary panel on mission and performance, and I guess leadership. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, um, so hopefully we're back on stage. I'd like to invite um, 
I know that we have on the screen uh, two of our panelists and two are in the room. So before we introduce the panel formally, I just want to thank Michael and the panel of authors. One of the great things that we get to do at the center is to identify and publish the work of young rising star scholars. And I think we have three terrific uh, scholars that we work with here. And, and of course, there are many more that we get to work with. And the book they contributed to Transforming the Business of Government is all about helping the government to move into an uncertain and complex future with key capabilities to improve performance where innovation and resilience can help meet tomorrow's needs. And those needs matter to the nation because they're delivered through managing key programs and services in and across agencies. And these include health and social benefits for veterans, for homeowners, for workers, safety and security for the labor force, and support for expanding into missions into space and, and other new frontiers. And we're, we're so honored to have a group of leaders from across administrations with service that spans the center's 25 years and more uh, to reflect on how effective management drives key mission outcomes for agencies. So I'd like to invite um, uh, in the room, Scott Gould and Nani Coloretti, if you can kind of head to the stage and then we're gonna, uh, I think we see uh, two our panelists who are joining me on the screen, uh, Sean O'Keefe and Chris Liu here. Um, so go ahead and just kind of get situated and I'll start the introductions. Um, so each of these esteemed leaders has careers that if I did a full introduction would take the rest of the time. So I'm not going to do that. But I will um, focus a little bit on their leadership roles in government, starting with Sean O'Keefe, who was the DOD controller, the secretary of the Navy, the deputy director of OMB, the NASA administrator, and the chancellor of Louisiana State University. And Sean is coming to us from Syracuse, where he teaches at the Syracuse Maxwell School. Welcome, Sean. Thank you very much, Pam. Thank you. And um, also on screen, uh, Chris Liu. Uh, Chris served, uh, among other things, as White House Cabinet Secretary and the Deputy Secretary of Labor. Chris is now the United States Ambassador to the United Nations for Management and Reform. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for joining us from the UN headquarters. And in the room, uh, we have uh, Scott Gould. Uh, Scott, who was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Administration Management at the Treasury Department the Chief Financial Officer at the Commerce Department, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, and spent 26 years in the United States Navy. Scott's now the CEO of Met Lake Associates. Welcome, Scott. And finally, Nani Coloretti. Uh, Nani, who uh, started as an OMB staffer with me in the 1990s. Uh, Nani um, served also as the Assistant Secretary for Management at Treasury, the Deputy Secretary at HUD, uh, along the way, Nani served as the budget director for San Francisco under then Mayor Gavin Newsom. And Nani then was the senior vice president at the Urban Institute and is now, of course, the deputy director at OMB. Welcome, Nani. Hi. Terrific. So we're going to start by asking questions of each of our guests, and then we'll kind of have a discussion. Um, so starting with Sean. Sean, you served as deputy director at OMB and at NASA administrator, and now you're teaching future leaders at, at Maxwell. So, so a NASA proverb often quoted holds that the staff who take care of agency facilities know that they also help land mankind on the moon and are now doing the same for Mars and other missions. What elements of leadership do you find most important in driving a mission-based culture through roles that are often thought of as sort of management or mission support? That's a great question, Dan. I mean, the uh, uh, choice of, of selecting a NASA anecdote is really quite poetic in some respects because that's an agency that there is no difficulty whatsoever identifying what the mission objective is. Everybody who's attached to some activity can tell you with certainty exactly what it is they're working on. Now, the big trick is having everybody within the agency itself uh, act in concert with some larger strategic objective. Uh, because otherwise what you have is wild geese flying in formation occasionally <laughs> or by accident, you know? And so this is one of those conditions where we have to define the mission very carefully, be very clear that everybody understands the same goal and in turn also have the same definition of success. Once that's accomplished, you've hit the, the, the answer to your, I think, very important question going forward. Thanks so much, Sean. So I want to go into the room to Scott. Scott, as Deputy Secretary at VA, 
You've led teams across the agency in reducing wait times, improving services for veterans and their families, critically important mission outcomes, initiatives that laid a foundation for continued improvements today. Um, so you led in a direct service agency environment. What did you observe as key innovations that can drive outcomes from health and social benefits at the scale of a major delivery organization like the VA? Dan, I'm going to make two comments before I answer that question. One is incredibly intimidating to be up here with all of you who have been advisors, coaches, mentors, go-to executives, and ultimately friends over the years. Just want to appreciate all the folks who are classically referred to as government geeks out there right now. Uh, and secondly, just to um, compliment uh, the Partnership for Public Service and the IBM Center, you're doing what essentially all great think tanks, do tanks do, and that is really trying to anticipate what the problems are in the future to prepare all of us who are in government at a particular time and in that moment of crisis need to, to reach out for help. Well done. <clears throat> now directly to Dan's question, um, look, uh, you don't always have to innovate by going to the moon or to Mars. I think there are <laughs> classically probably six or seven kinds of innovation. One is the need to do things better and faster, so-called process innovation. And the third that I wanted to mention is something commonly referred to as a crisis. You're in trouble. The outcome that you have achieved in government is no longer satisfactory, and you have absolutely got to get to a new place muy pronto. So the question is, what do you do about that? And the first thing I always did in government was try to connect with the mission and try to connect with the people who must implement it around two core values. One is the public trust. This, these are people, buildings, money, an infrastructure that has been built over centuries by our country. And just for a moment, just for a year or two, perhaps even for a career, we have the trust of the public to deploy those resources in service of their needs. And also uh, with respect to uh, connecting to the public trust itself, that is, uh, excuse me, the public good. And that is a very, very demanding principle. It is not simply a market segment, uh, which we used to do at IBM. It's not simply a group of customers, it's everybody. And that moment when you realize you're sort of carrying the torch for everybody who has a right and who's paying tax dollars to get a service done in our great country uh, is a great moment. Well, once you've connected in terms of values and mission and those uh, key uh, items that I just mentioned, I think really then the breakdown is around uh, people, uh, around uh, technology, and around policy and business processes that enable the delivery of those services. I hope we have a chance to get into more of the details on that later. Well, thanks, Scott. And, and thanks also for referring to your time at IBM, a point of personal privilege. You were part of the IBM Center as a senior fellow uh, while you were here. So thank you for being part of that story. And in another point of personal privilege, both you and Nani live in my neighborhood and our kids all went to the same high school. Uh, so uh, so that, that's a very important thing uh, as we go forward. I'm going to come back to Nani, but first I want to go to Chris. Um, Chris, both uh, at the White House and, and um, now at the UN, you've led different kinds of management reform efforts, also, of course, at the Labor Department. And you've had different views on how management can drive outcomes that fosters safety and resilience and given risks in lots of different changing con contexts. What are some examples of managing resiliency that you've seen as proving effective as these different levels? Are there commonalities between, for example, building resilience for local issues like workplace rights and safety versus global issues at the scale of the UN? Uh, thanks, Dan. I'll go back to something that both um, Sean and Scott said. I, it ultimately comes down to people and culture. Um, it, that won't surprise you since I was a former Deputy Secretary of Labor. The workforce is the most important asset you have in any organization, private sector or public organization. Um, I'm a big fan of the quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You know, when we came into the Department of Labor in 2014, uh, in the, um, uh, the best places to work survey, the Department of Labor was tied for last, tied for second to last in the federal government, 17 out of 19 large federal agencies. Two years later, we were number six in the federal government. We were one of the most improved federal agencies. Look, fixing culture doesn't solve all of your problems, particularly if it, the, the agency is so 
severely under-resourced, but it's an important part of the solution that people really need to focus on more. Fast forward now to the work that we're doing at the United Nations, very similar situation, really important mission, very dedicated workforce, um, severely under-resourced for the crises that the world is facing. Um, and so we're working now in obviously a different context, since I don't work at the UN, we, we, we try to push and prod um, as one of the key member states at the UN um, to try to you know, improve the system by which people in the headquarters can go work in the field. We try to improve retention. We try to bring new people into the organization. We try to improve the IT tools available to them. We try to bring concepts like behavioral science and predictive analytics into the work that the UN does so that the people there um, have more ability to solve these world problems. And so um, we are trying. Um, it's a much different uh, context. And I never thought I'd say this. I thought dealing with Congress was hard, dealing with OMB is hard. It's a whole different level of complexity when you're trying to negotiate with the Russians and the Chinese on how to manage the United Nations. Thanks, Chris. And we'll come back uh, to that as well. And um, so now I want to go to Nani. Um, Nani, of course, at his Deputy Secretary at HUD and as Deputy at OMB. You've led large decision-making processes on the effective allocation of resources to achieve mission outcomes. I suppose you did this in San Francisco at a different scale. Um, what are some key questions and considerations that you think are important to pose in managing resources in a way that incentivizes improved performance? And are there examples you'd point to regarding how this is done either from HUD or OMB? So thanks for this question. And Dan, I just wanna say that we lost you all for a moment there. Um, and I'm sorry about that because I really wanted to hear what Chris had to say at the beginning, but we heard, we caught you at the end there, Chris. Um, I also wanna say uh, happy birthday to the IBM Center on the business of government. It is um, incredible that you've been here for 25 years. I cannot believe it. And I also um, wish that you could see this amazing audience. It's like all the best people who have done all the hard things. So it is incredibly intimidating to be here. So anyway, um, so I'm the deputy director of OMB right now. And I just want to say, Chris, it really is not that hard to work with us. Um, <laughs> I did catch um, that part of your, um, but I, what I want to sort of shift to a little bit is I think what you're sort of asking Dan is, you know, how can we ensure that our resources are going to enable that we get the best outcomes out of our investments? And we heard a really great panel just before this with Renata and others about, about some of these concepts and issues. And I wanna kind of talk about two things just really quickly that we are really focusing on at OMB across uh, the budget and management teams. And that is our work in customer experience and our work in evidence-based policymaking. I think these are two things that have been growing up over the years and are really kind of poised to make a difference in increasing uh, trust, some of the things that Scott talked about in government, and actually taking into account both what works and, uh, and who our end user is who, is, who is needing government services. So OMB has really focused on this by um, taking into account uh, five life experiences. And just to give you a for instance or for example, you know, and I, this is personal to me because of the disaster that just happened in Maui. Um, after you have lost everything and everything has burned to the ground, you should not be asked to fill out three different forms and give the government, the federal government, information it already has about you um, to FEMA and then to HUD and then to the Small Business Association. And so that is one of our, our big projects that we're making a lot of progress on to basically use the data that the government has and to verify it and help take more of a um, user-centered approach to how we design those services. And um, if you think about it, shift it over to OMB and so how are we um, coordinating and collaborating on this kind of work? We are um, doubling down on our investments. This is not a lot of money. This is about how you do the work. And so in the FY24 president's budget, we um, asked for a half a billion dollars across several agencies to basically enable those agencies to do this kind of work more effectively and, um, and in a more collaborative way. And so we're really proud of that work and we're building on that. And we also um, are doubling down on evidence-based um, policymaking, 
we actually have uh, the evidence team and all parts of the management team review all of the budgets that come in. So when I sit down with Shalanda Young, the director of OMB, and we go over every budget, we actually have a section that is the budget review from the management team's perspective. And we go through um, each of our initiatives and our, and our big goals that we wanna accomplish and how that agency's budget stacks up for that. And that's how we were able to sort of put investments where we need to in customer experience in evidence-based policy making and other parts of the presence management agenda. Well, thanks, Donnie. Great, great examples. And by the way, we will be making the whole video uh, available after the fact. So if there, there are any glitches along the way, you'll be able to watch it uh, in the comfort of your own home, your own home, just like I am right now, um, and see it uh, going forward. So thank you. Um, so let's get into a little bit of discussion, and then we're going to go to the audience for some Q&A that Margie Graves will uh, moderate. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask any of you if you want to talk about a role model you have around good management and, and what about that person's approach would benefit leaders of government today and going forward? Anybody wanna note anyone? I'll uh, uh, jump in and uh, Dave Liebrich in the back will recognize a great um, leader in Bob Rubin who was the Secretary of Treasury uh, years ago. And I got to thinking about one of the lessons I learned from him was a very simple one, which is really uh, recruit the very best people that you can to work, wait until you have the right one and then bring them on and empower them. And I was reflecting on that experience uh, at Treasury for over three years and realized that in the 25 or so people uh, whom he and others selected with a great deal of care uh, for that time in the administration, uh, there were subsequently four cabinet secretaries, two university presidents, two deputy secretaries, two fed governors, and five CEOs of name brand companies. And it's just a wonderful example of uh, the adage that people are strategy and that you need to really bring great people into government. I'm sitting next to one of them uh, to do this work that we're entrusted with. Anybody else? I'll go next because I cannot believe you picked Bob Rubin because I was thinking about this and I was thinking, you know, a good manager is a good leader. And I thought about Tim Geithner. And so there's a clear line of sight. He is someone that Bob Rubin um, actually uh, picked it out of the career staff to come into Treasury's front office. And they still do that. And quite frankly, we do that at OMB too. We ask the career staff to come work with us when we're there. And so Tim Geithner had um, some qualities that I think are really important in a leader and a manager. Um, first of all, it's important to be able to handle um, very tough and complex issues under incredible duress and stress, but actually not exhibit that stress towards your staff. And Tim did that in spades. The other thing that he was, and he, by the way, wanted us to call him Tim. Nobody called him Secretary Geithner. Um, the other thing that he um, asked us to do was he asked us to not be, um, uh, how did he put it? He said, uh, speak the truth to me. Um, I don't want you to, you know, you know, kind of bow down to the altar of the secretary of the treasury. I need to know what is going on and what is wrong. And you need to basically, and, and do that quickly. You don't feel like, don't feel like you're gonna hurt my feelings. Um, and that was gave people um, sort of the freedom to tell them what was wrong and to tell them uh, how, how, what some options were to fix it. Um, uh, so I think that's a quality that's a good leader and a good manager. And then I'll also say that he was a very good listener. Um, he rarely spoke um, at the beginning of meeting. And this is at the treasury department, which as you can imagine have, has a lot of people that like to talk a lot um, <laughs> and um, show how you know smart they are. And so he would let them do that. And, um, and then he would sort of summarize everything. And I, I'm sure Bob Rubin did this too, in a way that made everybody feel heard, even though he wasn't agreeing with anybody necessarily. Um, it may be that we all had to go back and do more work. And I just, I, I watched that and I just thought, this is really not just a great, you know, uh, manager, but an incredible, incredible um, leader. And so I would just say, I, I, there's a clear line of sight from Bob Rubin to, to Scott, to me, and, and, and that's, you know, runs mm -hmm. through Tim Geithner. Thanks, Donnie. I remember working with Tim Geithner in the 2008 transition when he was architecting a lot of the recovery effort. Of course, Chris led that transition. Um, Chris, uh, any thoughts from you about role models? 
I, look, this is a cop out answer, but I'm going to say the people on the screen or the people I'm looking at are some of the uh, role models of people that I look at, of uh, just really some of the finest managers. But here's my beef, though. I don't actually think we are called on often enough to provide our advice to current government leaders. Um, and, and I think that's I think that's a mistake. And I think that's a missed opportunity because, look, love talking to academics, love talking to people who think about these issues. But I guarantee you that in any one of these agencies right now, these leaders are confronting the same problems that we've confronted. And not like I have all the answers to everything, but I've seen a lot of stuff. And, and, and I do wonder, I mean, I know the Partnership for Public Service, you know, does some sessions where we go and talk to them, but I really do wonder whether there ought to be more of a hand-holding, mentoring, kind of like a, a safe space that, you know, we can gather together to talk about these problems and, and share some of these insights that we have from our time in government. Yeah, I think you mentioned the partnerships programs, the, the Senior Advisors of Government Executives Program, the SAGES are, are one of those, those places. And, and I think, yeah, more could be done with that and other kinds of programs to to advise current government leaders. So, Sean, I, I want you to have a chance to answer the question, but I know that you also have views on sort of this in, in the larger context of leadership over change. So can I kind of shift to the next question and then we can go go from there? Oh, sure. Um, so thinking about, you know, who you've seen do this well, but also thinking about where we are today and going forward, we're in a period of high complexity and future uncertainty. There are CRs, potential shutdowns, there's an election coming up. Um, you've all been in leadership positions during multiple years like this. And so the key is how do you keep focused on managing for outcomes during times where significant change can be very disruptive? And you know, are there leaders that you've seen, Sean, that are role models in this situation and or are, are structures like the president's management agenda started in your administration when I was working for you at OMB? Um, and continuing today through, through I think, five administrations as a process um, and the OMB team, Dustin Brown and his team at OMB sort of working this, have created a lot of energy across different administrations. Are, those, are, are there examples of either people or structures and sort of managing change in an uncertain time? Uh, that's, a, that's a really important set of issues all wrapped up into a very uh, complex question you posed in. I think it's an important one. Uh, and it, it motivated me to think about who I've, I've ever had the privilege of dealing with who had a means to bring all those issues into perspective to respond to many of those, those uh, circumstances. And it, it reminded me very prominently of um, a fellow who, in a very formative phase of my, my uh, early public service career, was Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, Don Atwood, uh, who was probably the least likely person that you could think of if you looked at his resume, who would really understand exactly how the, the, the process within government and management and so forth works effectively. Uh, Don Atwood was a, a, a career uh, automotive industry executive, an industrialist, uh, had some engagement, mostly exterior, you know, to to the to the government itself uh, as an engagement service time. But he came into the capacity uh, as Deputy Secretary of Defense, having served as Vice Chairman uh, of GM for uh, several years. Uh, he came into the capacity as Deputy Secretary with a mindset that the real expertise within any administration at any point, but particularly at the beginning, uh, is within the career force. The folks who really do understand the, the history, how things have come to be, have different perspectives, of course, uh, on what they think is the most effective or efficient way to accomplish a task uh, or to, to manage an outcome but at the same time also have a very firm understanding that it is within the leadership, those elected by the people uh, and the, who are direct appointees of the administration uh, to help work through the challenges of successfully achieving those outcomes. That's why he always went through and many of the comments and, and characteristics offered by my colleagues here on this panel uh, were things that, that Don Atwood did at uh, just as a matter of course, 
at all times. He would bring in a wide selection of people, solicit different views, ask for different uh, uh, approaches to things, and whether he actually followed through on that or not, everybody felt like at least their opinion was heard and the opportunity was presented. And it wasn't just a collection of appointees. It was a collection of career force folks, folks who had been you know, steeped in the, in the, the, uh, the issues. So there is a, uh, I think a, a recipe in that, that, that worked very well, that, that really impressed me. And I've tried to carry that set of characteristics, not nearly as well as he ever did, uh, for the purpose of trying to, uh, uh, to lead in the portfolios that I was privileged to, uh, to have an opportunity to deal with. That was always a, a real strong example. And he always focused on professional development, even at the expense you know, of, of everybody engaged in the activities and trying to find opportunities to really shape their, their uh, capacity to deal with challenges going forward, even over the, the price of uh, projects and programs. Those are all here today, going to be finished by sometime tomorrow. Instead, the professional development is a long-term investment in the future. And that's why he was such an advocate of the career force and its great value and understanding how he actually achieved something, define what the objective is, and then in turn motivate them to uh, those who have the expertise to actually go carry it out. Such an important dis discussion around the, the work between political leaders and career experts at a time when that is being questioned. Um, other perspectives on, on this question, leading at a time of change? I could just say a couple words on that. I mean, I just, in, in witnessing um, sort of that kind of change, both um, a party turnover, but also just um, trying to manage in a time of a potential government lapse in appropriations. Um, we had two of those run-ups and there are more coming. Um, I think it's it's um, it, it helps to have a culture that is outcomes focused. Um, so I do think the president's management agenda, um, and there's a clear line of sight to, you know, what Sean and, and Dan worked on all the way to today, is very helpful to keep people focused. Um, but I also think it's important to build capacity, as people have been saying here today in different ways, which is yeah. your people, your process, and your systems. If you just are going to pick one of those, pick people, <laughs> because um, the SES cadre is what actually signals um, both to an incoming administration, but also more, much more importantly to the staff that um, things are going to be okay and that they can continue to do their work in serving the American people because the work actually never stops. Uh, and so, um, you know, people investment is is the most important thing to do. Mm -hmm. So before we uh, leave the president's management agenda topic, I do want to note that Jonathan Bruhl, I believe, wrote the first draft of the very first PMA. So we can draw the line back to Jonathan's desk. Um, uh, and of course, Jonathan went, then went to IBM. And that leads us to our next question, which is about public-private partnerships. Um, so many in the room today are partners in industry working with government. Um, Traditionally, people think about contract type relationships in terms of how industry and government work together. Are there other ways at a strategic level that industry can contribute to effective management in government in terms of roles and responsibilities? Throw it open. Uh, yeah, so let me let me jump in because this is something that we've been working at hard in, in New York. Um, the UN, unfortunately, probably like many other governmental entities, views every problem as one for only government to solve. Um, and when you're trying to address global health issues, global education issues, you're dealing with humanitarian activities, you can't leave the private sector on the sidelines. Uh, climate change is another wonderful example of that. Um, and so one of the things that we've helped kick off is something called the Private Sector Humanitarian Alliance. So this is a, a, an entity that we have helped foster, but it will live outside the UN system. And in the event of an earthquake in Turkey or a flood in Pakistan, yes, the, the governmental money is critical, but it it's the resources like 
Airbnb, after the invasion of Ukraine, opened up its platform so refugees um, could access housing in Eastern Europe. It is Visa coming in and helping to shore up Ukraine's financial system um, after uh, the invasion. Uh, it is um, relying on, if you're trying to get goods and supplies to uh, a, an area affected by disaster, you don't use, with all due respect, you don't use the Defense Department. You call Amazon, which does logistics better than anybody. You go to FedEx, you go to DHL, which have planes, not just planes that can fly them in there. They have trucks that can carry the resources um, off the off the tarmac. So this is what we're trying to do. And look, we're trying to unlock more government resource, I mean, private sector resources, but it's really the expertise of the private sector that I don't think we use as effectively as we can in government. Thanks, Chris. And I think there may be um, there may be something going on between uh, New York and here. So I think we lost just the end of that. But you were talking about the um, the just different ways the UN works with the private and public sectors and, and the importance of doing that for different parts of the mission. Just to kind of reiterate for the room. Uh, and I'm told that you can't hear me either. Is that what's going on, Ruth? Okay. So. Um, I think the answer to that was yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to quickly. Why don't, why don't we go to audience? Audience, 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 audience. Can you hear me now, Ruth? Okay, great. So uh, now we're back on. Um, terrific. Uh, so let's just go to the, the last question. Um, and uh, uh, that is really about people who are in the room who are doing teaching and research about government programs. And many here today are leaders in that environment. What would you like to see from scholarship that can benefit leaders? Uh, what, can, what skills do, to, do students today and leaders tomorrow need to strengthen effective management? And then we'll go to the audience for, for questions. Uh, glad to uh, add a couple of ideas to the fire. Uh, one is we've had this list of terribles, uh, you know, all the things that could happen in the next 10 years. And I want to think about the meta process of the leaders who will confront those issues in the next decade. One of the areas of research that I'd love to see more about is how do leaders confront those issues, uh, uh, perform in the same way that Sean was describing his deputy secretary and mentor of years ago, bringing people together in a crisis quickly allocating responsibilities, collecting information, deciding on something new, defining a course of action, resourcing it and moving out. What does that look like? It's the equivalent of the Rickover manual and the submarines that is the, the, um, the SOP for an unknown emergency. Now, what would that look like? So I'll add to that, um, obviously an area that has already been discussed today around uh, uh, and specifically in the ability for government to process claims Imagine the ability to help the VA eliminate its backlog, uh, address the backlog of appeals for Social Security Administration to process claims more quickly and more accurately. I think there's an enormous area of opportunity here where we could work that together, technology, people, and process. Any other short thoughts on scholarship and future studies, things the center can do? I, again, I, th I think a lot of what uh, the center has accomplished in the last 25 years is a constant uh, linkage of that scholarship and the actual administration, the implementation of things. That is a huge, huge linkage. And it's one that uh, I think scholars um, constantly look to exactly how can we apply this particular set of principles going forward? How do you make this more than just a research exercise? Uh, and how do, you, how do you accomplish that task? Uh, I was struck by uh, the most recent report just released here uh, not, not too long ago on preparing government for future shocks, building climate resilience. There was a range of things that Chris Mim uh, identified there that I think are really important features of how to apply some of the research principles. And Chris is a, a colleague of mine here at the Syracuse Maxwell School and was able to put together that when he combined that with an awful lot of his own background and experience uh, uh, at GAO for as long as he was there. I think those are the kinds of opportunities 
uh, that are being really exercised now. And again, Dan, I congratulate you and the center on 25 years of excellence in doing that. Uh, but to continue is to take that recipe that clearly has uh, a terrific appeal to scholars as well as practitioners to see the results of uh, what you see as a problem. So identifying those problems, just as uh, uh, Scott just did, of, of just really being clear about a specific objective that they're looking to uh, accomplish, that sends off the, the application of the research in exactly the right direction. Great. Any final thoughts, Nani or Chris, before we go to the audience? Dan, I would just say um, continue to do work on how enabling, uh, how good management can enable mission accomplishment. And so tell that story. What does it really look like? Um, what are the elements that honestly can be taught, can be practiced, can be infused into a culture that can turn an organization into a high performing organization because of the people in it are practicing um, their management and leadership and um, uh, kind of skills with care in a way that actually serves the mission and accomplishes the mission. And, and I'm really interested in one. I in communication, facilitation, a lot of the soft skills where, um, you know, you really, you really have to do those things in person. I, I hate to say it um, because I know that there's resistance across um, in all of our lives and having to do this. And I really am grateful that we can have um, a Zoom conversation um, like the Jetsons here. I don't think 25 years ago we could have done that. Um, but I also think that there is an incredible need for good facilitators, good communicators, and good managers and leaders, and those things can be taught. And I would love to see some more research on examples where that really did um, get put in service of mission. Uh, Dan, Dan, I'll add quickly, I, I think there needs, at least from my perspective, some more thinking and training about how, how does one create an effective performance management system in government. We know how to do this in the private sector. I think in government, we continue to rely more on outputs and outcomes. Um, and frankly, I could use a little more training on that. So I encourage others to do some work on this. Thanks. There's a quick, uh, quick addition to that a superb uh, suggestion. And that is, could we please have a national discussion around key performance indicators on an outcome level? And what would that look like? So we could have our arguments about you do or you don't want literacy, you do, you don't want a healthy society, health, and then sort of back into the enabling policy and technology and people investments and that would have to go with that. Scott, I can't think of a better room for that challenge to be laid to, on the table. Um, so on that note, uh, I wanna introduce Margie Graves, our senior fellow, the former deputy federal CIO at OMB and deputy CIO at DHS. And Margie's gonna run the audience Q&A and close the meeting. So Margie, over to you. <laughs> so we're open for questions for the panelists. If you have anything that you'd like to explore either in current topics that have already been discussed or bring up something new. Yes, sir. I mean, uh, I think that the issue about performance and, and getting the call is absolutely uh, crucial. I really appreciated that. What I'm curious, and this is kind of generally to the panel and follows up with this delusion point, is about performance management is how do you see the role of incentive uh, in the system to drive performance? Both incentives at, I'd say, the program performance level or at the individual you know, yeah, employee level. So incentives and measurements for driving outcomes that we were just talking about. Anyone want to take that on? Okay, let me just ask, and I, I don't want to dime out Nani, but I will. I mean, this is what we do as federal agencies when we put our budget submissions. We have to justify that these programs work. I, I don't know, I, oh, Nani, from your perspective, are you getting the information you want? Are you making decisions, funding decisions based on what agencies submit? Uh, yes, absolutely. The answer to that is yes, we do make decisions based on what agencies submit. We do actually ask for um, outcomes. We do a deeper dive on that, as I mentioned before, on evidence and outcomes. Um, I would say in terms of incentivizing, it's interesting because I know that 
the federal government still um, does performance, you know, awards. Um, there's a whole bunch of research that actually shows that that doesn't incentivize, it disincentivizes, but we still do it. So does everybody else in the whole wide world. So it's not, it's not the federal government's fault here. Um, I would say as a, as a manager myself or a leader that I have, I have also noticed that that is not what incentivizes individual performance. Um, I think individual performance is incentivized by feeling like you are, have a sense of belonging, that you have agency and that you are continuously learning and contributing to the mission, the outcome, the goal. And these things can be taught. So that is what we should focus our leaders on. Yeah, I, I've been accused of joining the Navy when ships were made of wood and men of iron. Uh, but I, I remember working for $9,800 a year, not owning a car, not having an apartment, living on a ship, eating ship food all the time. Never been happier. Great, great mission, ton of fun. Uh, it's natural for us to take it, pay flexibilities, money, time off, investment uh, in uh, training opportunities and the like, but recognition, a leader that cares, someone who's invested in the growth, uh, as Nani was just saying, of their employees is a huge way uh, to provide the kind of incentives towards more risk-taking and more innovation that have been a subject of conversation today. And who are you going to go to the ends of the earth and work for? And just do everything exactly, yeah. exactly, and and it doesn't matter what hours you're putting in because you you care. Dave Walker, former Controller General. To me, there's three levels. There's strategic, macro. There's micro, and there's the middle. The macro is our finances are in terrible shape. We got to make a lot of tough choices there, or else we're gonna we're gonna be sinking. Mm -hmm. All right. Micro is people, process, technology. What can we do to try to improve economy, efficiency, effectiveness, that's fine. But what's missing is the middle. The government is 10 times bigger today than it was 100 years ago as a percentage of the economy. Uh, we're not focused on outcomes. When I was Comptroller General, we advocated for key national indicators, and many other countries are way ahead of us on that. You know, it's, it's how, many, how much money do you have? How many people do you have? It's not results. And so what is going to be done to put us in a position that we can basically to say, what should the federal government do? How should it do it? Who should do it? It's gotta be fundamentally re-engineered because we don't need nip and tuck. We need reconstructive surgery. Is there a question? <laughs> yeah. Duly noted. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, Kathy Stack, 27 years at OMB, set up the evidence team. Um, great to see you guys. Uh, question, I think this is for Nani, but anybody can weigh in. Um, I loved your customer experience example. And I think there's a close cousin there with state and local governments who are getting lots of different instructions from lots of different agencies and programs. They see the challenges. They know what they want to do in terms of being able to make all of those resources work effectively together. But they have absolutely no one at OMB or in the federal government who takes responsibility for listening and trying to cut through the bullshit and figure out what it is they can do. Just thoughts on that in terms of an OMB function? Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> Look, at I spent 10 years in um, in a city and a county. Um, and the way California is structured, the counties actually run a lot of the federal programs. So I know that of what you speak from, from a, a career, both in the federal um, space and in the state and local government space. I do actually... I did actually see some green shoots on this um, with um, the uh, American Recovery Program. There, there was a an interagency council that actually um, did some listening sessions and put out some recommendations on driving capital to into communities. And I thought that was really interesting. I actually. I'm embarrassed to say, did not know that had happened in the Biden administration, and it was um, Treasury, Commerce, HUD, FEMA and Department of Transportation. It's basically all the bigs who do grant making to um, state and local governments. And I do think that there's a green shoot there that could be built upon and make this better. So I have a little bit of a follow-up on that. In the sense Margie. 
<laughs> a little bit of a follow up on that in the sense that do you see you mentioned CX earlier, do you see an emphasis now in the federal budgetary process to look more horizontally about the compendium of programs that the federal government offers to state and local communities, and how we look at that from the view of outside in versus inside out. We're like, we're not pushing our programs to the states. We're actually looking at the citizen as a holistic person and how multiple programs support that citizen. I think that is happening in the targeted area. I feel like CX is like in a pilot stage in a way. There are actual real results that are coming from taking a user-centered approach. This is why I wanted to make sure I highlighted this and pulling it all the way. It's a, it's a, it's, the opposite way of the way that we think about these kinds of programs. And when you're talking about, you know, we don't need a nip and tuck, we need to completely redo it. That is actually a very um, incredible way to think about serving people. So I do see, again, green shoots in these areas where we're um, looking at life experiences and looking at and talking to the person who is trying to access and interact with the federal government. And I do think that um, resources are being arrayed towards fixing and addressing. And once you kind of identify some of the ways in which the user's experience could be improved, identifying that and improving it, um, using in a lot of cases, um, a technology approach. So I do like what's happening there. I think what you and Kathy might be asking is something a little more holistic, which has to do with looking at a cross cut of state and local investment and thinking about ways to kind of amplify what I just talked about in, in kind of a more concrete, concrete way, I would say that is not happening. <laughs> um, I, you know, but it is a very important idea. And I, you know, and I, as with all of the, the question comments that we're getting, I'm duly noting them. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, back here first. Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much. I'm Wolfgang Rodler from IBM down in the Innovation Studio. Happy birthday to the center. And uh, thank you so much for supporting us with all you've done, Dan, uh, throughout the years. Um, my question is, I, I love the fact that you all spoke about that the people are the most important factor that you can actually have in uh, the government, right? And culture eats uh, strategy for breakfast, as we all know. So my question would be, first of all, how do you actually attract the right talents? And how do you then select them? So attraction and selection kind of the question for the panel so i'm also going to turn to the screen because i think we need to pull other folks into the equation here so sean or chris if either one of you want to tackle that first i guess the the, the primary recruiting mechanism uh, that you can always find is to identify specifically again as as mentioned in the very first question what the mission is and then who will be the beneficiaries? And I didn't make this a very personal proposition uh, that I, in part addresses the last commentary as well, uh, which is the closer you can identify this with people that you, you see as benefit or not, or consequent to whatever it is you do, the greater the association will be and, and willingness to really dive into it. Recruiting folks that can that you can identify what those linkages are becomes the most attractive feature I found for the kinds of people you want. Sure, you can get lots of you know folks who claim to have or have depth of expertise or whatever else, but if they're really not passionate about how am I going to leave the situation better than the way I found it, then you're missing the point of what public service is all about. And maybe you ought to be thinking about something anyway, something else anyway, I should say. So it, it's it's a uh, it's an opportunity, I think, to really put those linkages together for multiple purposes, and it's an absolutely ideal circumstance to really determining who is it you're trying to recruit and what their objectives ought to be uh, while they're there, and see if that passion is enough to really want to motivate them to be there. That's what's going to make the determination anyway. And then what can you do to provide the skills and necessary uh, capacity for some of those folks to uh, very easily carry out the objective because they are, they do believe in it. Yeah, I took a lesson from one of our leaders at DHS, uh, Admiral, Admiral Thad Allen, who said, my job is to get all the obstacles out of the way 
so that you can go do good work. Yep. And that's exactly what you were just talking about. So that exactly. Resonates. Uh, let me let me chime in. And I do this at the risk of offending two Navy people on the call. Um, I, I always go back to this great Steve Jobs quote. It's better to be a pirate than to join the Navy. Um, and, and I say that because I, whether it's the federal government, whether it's the military or the Foreign Service, which is an organization I work in now, these are seniority based systems that are reward people who do well, but not go out on a limb and take risks. Um, and, and I think that's a flaw and I think something we need to consider. I mean, in the military, you could be the most brilliant person, but you're not becoming a general or an admiral at the age of 40 or 35. You're certainly not going to be an ambassador at the age of 35 in the, the foreign service. And in the federal government and the civil service, it's the same way. We have to figure out a way not only to bring in good, smart young people to encourage that risk taking. And if they are good promote them to leadership positions. And that's just not the way the current incentive system and promotion system in the federal government works right now. That's good. Oh, sorry. Ah, right here. Neil Wasserman from George Washington University. I just wanted to turn the attention back to the uh, AI uh, subject. And um, in, in my view, when we use explainable AI, that's kind of a contradiction in terms. We can explain risks associated with AI, but I would challenge anyone to really explain the processes of decision making in AI. Um, and if you look at uh, the um, uh, the way that risks are handled in the federal government at NIST, for example, there's a focus on process rather than outcome. And I return to the gentleman's previous uh, desire to focus on outcomes rather than process. It seems that we, when we don't understand some, when we feel Ill, Ill at ease, we focus on process, when the need is to focus on, on outcomes and measurable results. And I was wondering how you would uh, turn our attention in terms of, say, AI risk on, on outcomes and measurable results. Well, the one uh, principal way that comes to mind for me is around a set of key performance indicators that values the outcome that you're trying to create from the start. And then things align uh, in terms of resources, people, process, and technology to achieve uh, those outcomes that have had and been exposed to some reasonable amount of public discourse, debate, disagreement, dissent, but then finally settling on, okay, this is the objective that we want to achieve. And then AI becomes an enabler of that. I'm a strong believer, human in the loop uh, for all of these key judgments at the end of the day so that you have both a responsible individual set and supported in an organization and using technology that can be constantly evaluated for biases and improved over time. Yeah, and I think you know, this I'll is a perfect time for that. Go ahead. No, I was going to jump in because right now at the United Nations, the U.S. is about to embark on an effort to get the U.N. to pass a, a global resolution on AI. And I think it's, it illustrates, I think, one of the challenges we have in government, which is whether it's legislation, whether it's regulation, these are blunt tools. And I think we often, you know, and I think it, there's we're, we are... Um, we are reticent to use those tools because we do not want to stifle the innovation, which is why in terms of what the Biden administration is doing, it's largely in terms of either voluntary commitments with the tech companies, or it's in terms of broad standards. Some of the things that Scott just talked about, safety, security, accountability, transparency. You know, I mean, because at that level, I think we can sort of set benchmarks and norms, it gets much harder to regulate something that is such fast moving. You know, I think people forget ChatGPT, only came out 13 months ago, and, and AI has been the topic in every meeting like this I've been part of. So I think it, it is a challenge, and and the, the and right now I think too often we look at AI in terms of um, glass half empty without understanding the incredible benefits that are there. And I think that is one of the challenges of how we thread the needle. Where were we at? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So I'm Frank DeGiamarino, and I still do everything Ed DeSev tells me to do. <laughs> I'd like to give Shelly a thank you for the shout out on the Recovery Act. Um, my question is also in the form of a thought, which is I think one of the things we learned from the Recovery Act is that government hits the target and misses the point. We do really good things, and we set no context for people where they work, live, and raise their kids. And um, first of all, huge shout out 
to everybody in the center, and I love this room and everything that we do. How do we make sure that the people understand how this works and what they get and how uh, it's not about $170 million and 500 jobs, right? It's really about the strategic impact that's being made and the lives that are getting changed by the things that we do. Because whether we like it or not, we're losing the public will. Yeah. And so that is the piece that I would add into uh, Mr. Walker's excellent points, which is that we're as government administrators, as public administrators, we must maintain the public will and we must make the point all along the way. So my question is, does anybody have any good examples to share of ways that you're making the point? I mean, I do think there is a concerted effort to go out into communities and stand there, not just cut a ribbon, but actually tell the story of what, show the clear line of sight from what the funding was to actually what exists now, um, particularly around um, clean energy and also um, from the Chips and Science Act, there's been a number of um, wins that have, have started to kind of um, be known in communities when you can see um, the plant that is being um, opened. Um, I also think that a lot of the longer term investments have a tail um, and we just we, we just got them like a year a year ago some some of these laws are passed. And so I guess I would say that um, you know to continue to focus on telling that story and use storytelling as a way um, to get the message across about what, is actually happening in the federal government that might be helpful to someone who's not tracking all the time. And I know that the cabinet is, is very focused on that. Can I jump in? I, I think the press and the public expect a level of perfection from government services that they don't necessarily expect from the private sector. Frank knows this very well. You know, the Recovery Act made incredible investments into clean energy. And all we can think about is Solyndra, that company investment that went south. I mean, in terms of the success of the Recovery Act, that exceeds what you would get in terms of, you know, private investments. We think about during the pandemic, whether it's unemployment insurance claims going out, whether it's PPP loans absolutely concede that there was fraud, there was waste, but on balance, these programs worked very, very well and helped pull this country out of a recession. And yet the popular narrative is that the fraud outweighed the benefits that were done. And, you know, and this is a perpetual problem because those types of stories are more resonant than the good that is done. Absolutely. I think we probably uh, don't get as do as good a job of getting our stories out to the public in a positive sense, because we're busy delivering the mission. So there needs to be a better communications channel um, from multiple agencies. And I found this also in, in um, when legislation is passed, that there's an immediacy that uh, there should be an outcome uh, when you haven't even gotten the program started or, or off the ground. And, uh, and the the auditors come in very rapidly. So we have to change that mindset that there is a long-term investment that needs to be made in certain areas of the federal government that are not short-term and immediate. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm uh, I'm Al Berman, uh, and I know a lot of, lot of the folks here. Scott, it's great seeing you. Uh, I started out as another OMBer here, started out as a management intern handing out the budgets that first year. Uh, spent 20 something years at OMB, uh, went, uh, became an SES branch chief in the National Security Division. And then I uh, had the honor and privilege of going through a Senate confirmation to run procurement policy. So I ran OFPP. I did that acting under President Reagan. Then I went through it uh, under President Bush, the confirmation and worked on it with, uh, with uh, uh, President Clinton and, uh, and uh, it's, you know, it was a tremendous process. And this is kind of a process and outcome question as well, because when I went to OMB, the one thing you knew was that, hey, there is a decision-making process and requirement that has to occur because the government needs a budget. And now I'm in a position where I'm asking, well, is that really the case? I mean, you're kind of trying to figure out how are we, is there any way to go back to a way where you are actually working through these various appropriations 
one at a time? Or is the system so dysfunctional now that we're, re we're really going to be just stuck with doing these omnibus kinds of efforts forever? The, the other issue I have on OMB is, is the Schedule F stuff, of course, which is very scary as well. But uh, since Nani is here, I, I guess I'll <laughs> focus it. But uh, Sean actually started out working at the National Security Division with me many, many years ago. So, I mean, there's, oh, there's a lot of OMB, OMBers yeah. here that'd be great to see if we could find some kind of solution to that problem. So maybe I'll go to you first, Nani. Sure, and just by a show of hands, please raise your hand if you ever worked at OMB. <laughs> I mean, just, okay, all right, just, we're everywhere and I don't know, we're everywhere. Um, <laughs> I was only there for three years, but you know, I'm, I'm back. Um, so I guess what I would say is one thing to remember about um, appropriations is that the issues really are worked. You know, there's the, the notion that the president's budget is immediately thrown in the trash can and it never gets passed, you know, as it's, as it's sent up. That might be true that it never gets passed in the exact form that it's sent up, but every issue in there is worked. Um, I've actually had appropriation staff come in and say, remind us, like it is important that you put the president's budget out because, and this is very interesting and very insider government, CBO will score what you put in the budget. They do not have time to score every single idea I've got or that my boss has, but they will spend time on the president's budget. And those that analytical work is very, very important, remains very important to the work of the appropriations committees and sometimes the authorizing committees. So, so every single um, bill has um, been passed through the Senate. And I think many um, subcommittees in the House have passed their bills. They just, they wrote to a whole different number and that's why we're, we're, we are where we are. Um, but even if we end up with a series of um, you know, whatever happens with the appropriations, if it is some kind of minibus or omnibus, it will actually take into account that work that was done. Um, the the what I've come to understand, and I have no better boss in the um, in Shalanda Young, who spent 15 years in the Hill, is that the appropriation staff in both Senate, House, and um, Republican, Democrat are just like the civil servants in my mind, to my mind at OMB, in that they they kind of have been there for a long time. So there's a lot of knowledge, um, collective knowledge in in Congress, and we're lucky we're lucky to have that. And so the train that keeps moving called funding the government does keep moving. It does have um, some really good and serious um, professional work. And where it gets stuck is obviously in politics. And that's uh, you know, not not to reflect on on Paul, obviously I'm part of the Biden administration, but that's just reflecting a larger set of issues in our country. And it's up to us to um, to participate in politics and to talk to people and to make sure people can vote. I'll just say, you know, like we get the system that we we put time into, and it's important to put time into this one. Thanks. All right, thank you. So just as James Christian got to do the SNL live open, I get to do the goodbye. <laughs> Have, have a wonderful time. We have some refreshments and uh, really want you to mingle outside. So thank you for coming and joining us for this celebration of the IBM Center for the Business of Government. And also thank you for sticking with us all along the way in terms of your insightful inputs, your studies, your actual um, research and your uh, experience that you had within the federal government that make us all smarter and we will carry forward for another 25 years with your help. Thanks very much. <laughs>